I'm going to ask a question, not to embarrass you, but uh, just to know uh, how many people weren't here last week. There's a reason for it. If you weren't able to be here last week, raise, raise your hand. Probably enough of you I need to explain why I'm talking about strip clubs, okay? <laughs> so let, let, me, let me kind of back up just a little bit. Uh, our women's ministry recently decided to do kind of a, a, a really out-of-the-boat, out-of-the-box idea, and uh, they decided to take gift bags uh, to the ladies working at, at uh, uh, two strip clubs between here and Dothan. They're going to fill it full of, you know, lotions and soaps and uh, some information about Jesus and uh, an invitation to visit our church. And uh, so this week, on Friday actually, uh, they delivered 36 gift bags to those two clubs. And so uh, I'm really proud of them for doing that. Proud of you for praying uh, about that if you have. Uh, and uh, some people even brought by boxes of stuff to go in the bags and money donated to put in there. So I'm, I'm happy and thankful to all of you for helping that, with that kind of out-of-the-boat ministry. Uh, somebody asked me if I was going to go with them, and I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> all I need is for somebody to come back from Dothan and my truck be parked at, at Teaser's. <laughs> And somebody take a picture of that. So, no, I didn't go. We had a couple of our ladies go. Uh, but, uh, you know, Joyce has been working on this all week. And uh, one night this week I was watching television. Joyce was sitting close to me on the couch uh, doing something on her laptop. And just out of the blue, but very casually, just routinely, she says, Hey, honey, would you turn down the TV? I've got to call the strip club. Now, that may be said in your house on a routine basis, but that's the first time it's ever been said in my house. And I admit it caught me by surprise. I wasn't expecting that. Now, I'm the one up here preaching about get out of your boat, but I'm going to tell you so that you'll know I'm always preaching myself. I'll confess what my first reaction was. Let somebody else call a strip club, not my wife. In other words, let somebody else get out of that boat, but, but not me or somebody close to me. But that, that was wrong. And, and uh, you know, Joyce helped me to see that that was wrong. And, and she called those two clubs to coordinate delivery of those gift bags as casually as if she was ordering pizza. You know, it was just, and so it worked. And uh, <clears throat> later that night, another thought hit me. I thought... I wonder how many other pastors in Enterprise have heard their wives say, Honey, turn down the TV. i got to call the strip club. <laughs> no, wait a minute. How about in Alabama or the nation or the world? How about the universe? Has any other pastor ever heard his wife say, Hey, honey, turn down the TV. i got to call the strip club. <laughs> Probably not. But I'm glad I heard it because it's a challenge to me to, to, to reevaluate uh, maybe some boats that I'm stuck in. You know, and I wonder if my reaction is not a fairly common reaction for a lot of believers. When we hear about some person or church who's getting out of the boat, I wonder how often, how many of us think, uh, well, you know, that's surprising. Or, uh, you know, let somebody else do it. Or we just question the wisdom of doing it all together. And I, had to, I was convicted of that this week, and I was convicted of, of this question. If Jesus was here today, would I be surprised at how radical he is? I mean, you're talking about somebody who refused to get in the boat of established religion. You're talking about somebody who stayed outside all kinds of boats of man-made religious ideas and, and traditions. Would I be surprised at how different and how radical Jesus is. Yeah, you know, it's a question all of us need to ask because I think if we truly understood just how different he was, just how religiously radical he was, if we embrace that, then, then things like, honey, turn down the TV, I got to call the strip club, probably wouldn't surprise us as much because we would, we would be out of the boat and we would be with people who are out of the boat and we would be encouraging and supporting people who are out of the boat. Now, as we conclude this series, I want you to remember something I said last week. That I, I'm telling you to get out of, of the boat, but there's some boats I'm telling you to stay in and never get out of. Because there are some boats based on religious, I mean, based on biblical truth that, that we should never stray from. For example, 
the truth that the Bible is the divinely inspired, inerrant word of God. Don't ever get out of that boat. Stay, stay latched to that. Stay in it. Stay, stay comfortable with that. The biblical truth that, about who Jesus really is, that he was God in the flesh who came to live a perfect life so that he could be a sinless life, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice on a cross, and so he could rise from the dead with the power to forgive and the power to, to write your name in heaven's book for eternity because he conquered sin and death. Don't ever stray from that. Those boats are beliefs uh, of truth that you should never get out of. But when I ask, are you in or out, the challenge is, are you stuck in any tradition or habit or personal preference, any boat of comfort that you're unwilling to get out of to be who God wants you to be and to do what God wants you to do? I submit to you, all of us, have boats. None of us are yet completely who God wants us to be. So there's someone, there's something for everybody here to be challenged about today that we need to step out of a comfort zone. And so we're going to go back to the, to the boating story in the Bible that inspired all of this in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. So find a Bible. There's one under a chair around you somewhere if you didn't bring it. And... Uh, Turn to page 692 if you have one of those Bibles from under the chair, and that'll put you at Matthew 14. You find verse 22. And we'll read that famous story again about Jesus walking on the water and Peter getting out and walking on the water for a little bit. Uh, again, I preface this uh, by, by saying I, I believe it happened just the way it says it is. I don't, I don't have a problem uh, with my God being big enough to walk on the water. I don't, I don't have a problem with not fully being able to understand the physics or the laws of nature that allow that to happen. I don't have a problem with my God uh, giving Peter the ability to walk on water for, for a little bit. So just understand that's where I come from. I don't, I don't have to explain this. Uh, if my God can't do some things I don't understand, if he can't know some things that I don't know, then we're all in trouble, okay? So Matthew fourteen twenty two. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside to pray, by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus said to them, Take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Well, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And we covered a couple of things dealing with the question of are you in or out last week. We'll cover three more quickly today. The third one is... Uh, you need courage to get out of the boat, and the courage you need is available through Jesus. Uh, you may be a very brave person, you may be bold, you may be outspoken, outgoing, but I promise you there's a boat that is too scary for you to get out of. There's something that God may want you to do that's, that just scares you uh, to no end to think about getting out and doing it. The prelude to what happened with Peter walking on the water is in verse 27. And it's where Jesus comforted the, the frightened men in the boat by saying basically, hey, take courage, it's me, Jesus, I'm here. And I'm already out here to help you. And I think the connection to Peter being able to get out of the boat is, is that Peter's own personal courage, and remember Peter was the boldest, most outspoken of the twelve May have been the bravest, but he, but he was surely a brave man. Uh, but I think the connection is that Peter's own personal courage 
wasn't enough to get out of that boat. I mean, he needed to find some strength and encouragement somewhere else. And he found it in knowing that he wasn't going to be alone outside the boat. Can I just tell you that Jesus will never ask you to get out of a boat by yourself? He's always there with you. He's always uh, there as a support and as encouragement and as your strength. Can I tell you, he says the same thing to you. Some of you are in boats right now that, that it scares you, the wits out of you to think about getting out of. And Jesus is saying the same thing here today. It's okay, don't be afraid. I know, I know you're having trouble, but you find your courage in me. Know that I will be there. Know that I'm already outside that boat. See, he's already there waiting for you to get out. He won't pull you out or push you out, but he's there if you get out. You can find courage in knowing that. I've been around a lot of brave soldiers uh, in my life, uh, men and women who are willing to, to, to do all kinds of dangerous things and risk their own lives. And, you know, some of them are big old guys, big old muscly, bold, brave soldiers. And, but I'll tell you what I discovered is some of those biggest and boldest ones are like scared little puppies when it comes to getting out of a boat for Jesus. Some of them get weak in the knees at the thought of, of doing something that, that Jesus wants them to do. And that's because our own personal courage, no matter how bold we are, is not enough. I know every week, I, every Sunday of my career when I've preached, I've always challenged people to come to the front at the end of a service. Why? Because when God's word goes out, it makes a difference in people's lives. And sometimes that difference needs to be responded to publicly. Sometimes people need to, to get up and come down here and get on their knees based upon what God has pricked their heart about. And I know when I challenge people to come down here and do this, it scares some of them to death. I know that when I challenge people who've trusted Christ to come down here to the front and tell us, uh, some, some of them are, are, are too afraid to make that walk. I know that when I tell people every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ should be baptized, and if you haven't, you need to come and tell us the thoughts for some people of getting in that pool of water in front of all of you frightens them. I mean, every Sunday during the last song, there are death grips on the back of the chair in front of them. It's a wonder we don't have holes in some of these chairs where people have just squeezed the stuffing out of them to re because they're so afraid to do what they know God wants them to do, to get out of that boat and respond. I'm telling you, you're not alone in doing that. You don't have to do it out of your own strength or out of your own courage. You don't have to do whatever God wants you to do. I know people don't serve God because, because they're afraid to. People won't go to a Bible study because they're afraid they don't know enough. There are all kinds of boats of fear. And the good news is Jesus says, take courage. It, it's me. I'm here. I'm not asking you to do this by yourself. Fourth thing about being in or out is that getting out of your boat requires something, and it requires you to focus on Jesus when you get out. Now, in this story, Peter did okay for a few steps. We don't know how many steps he walked on the water. But Peter walked on the water. It says he did, and he came toward Jesus. But a few steps into that, he lost focus. And he quit focusing on Jesus. And what does it say? He began to see the wind and the waves around him. And he got scared, and he began to sink. Now, I'm telling you, if you get out of your boat, and you focus on yourself, and you focus on your way, and you focus on doing your own thing, you will sink. Because it's important to remain focused on the right person. That's because whatever God is calling you to do outside the boat doesn't depend on who you are. It doesn't depend on your strength. It doesn't depend on your ability. It depends on Him. Therefore, you've got to stay focused on Him. I want to tell you a story to illustrate the importance of being focused. Uh, back in December, Joyce and I went up to uh, Enterprise High School one night to their Christmas uh, concert, choir concert. And uh, uh, when we got there, we saw uh, Danny Hardy uh, there alone. And uh, her husband, Dusty, was probably off doing something really important that night, I'm sure. 
And she was alone, and so we said, hey, you sit with us, you know, so you don't have to sit by yourself. And she agreed. And so we walked into the auditorium, and I was walking right behind Danny. And uh, we, we passed some gentleman that, that knows her, and, and he stopped her, and they had a, they had a good chat. And, and so I just stopped right behind her. And at some point, the guy grabbed my hand, and he said, hello, Dusty, how are you? You're not Dusty. I said, no, I'm not, but I'll still shake your hand. Now, I've thought about that since that night. Dusty, come up here. I, I, I've thought about it, and I've thought, you know, what an incredibly easy mistake to make. <laughs> you know? I mean, look. I mean, how easy would it be for him to confuse two handsome young men like us? <laughs> All right? Like, how, how old are you? 32. Okay, now I'm going to ask you something. In the first service, you were 33. Did I say that? So are you are you thirty two or thirty three? Thirty two. Thirty two. Okay, you Nervous. can't you can't get younger. All right, but see, you know, I'll I'll be some, some something soon, and so there's not that much difference in our ages. So yeah, it's an easy mistake to make. How tall are you? About six two. Turn turn around. Let's see. So I probably had on flat shoes that night. So there's no there's no discrepancy there. So. We're good. I mean, just an easy mistake to make. And I thought, you know what? If, if Dusty didn't dye his beard, we'd probably look like twins. <laughs> right? So, you know, go sit down. Only in my dreams could I ever hope to be mistaken for you, okay? But I thought about it. I thought, you know, you know why he made that mistake that night, Danny? I don't know if you noticed. But when he turned to grab my hand, he was still focused on you. See what happens when you don't focus on the right person? See what happens when Peter lost focus on Jesus? Things begin to fall apart. Jesus is out there if we have the courage to follow his example and find strength in him. But he's out there to be focused on because it all depends on him. And if we step out of the boat as an individual and we begin to do it our way, and we begin to think, oh, wow, we, you know, this, we got this under control. We have a little bit of initial success. Peter had initial success. All was good for a few steps, but when he lost focus, he began to sink. We lose focus, we'll begin to sink. As a church, if we lose focus on who's responsible for every good thing that's happened here, guess what? It'll stop, and we'll begin to sink. Because getting out of the boat requires staying true and staying focused to the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, wrap this up. One more thing. Maybe the most important thing for a lot of people. At least it is for a lot of people I deal with. Getting out of your boat requires faith. It doesn't require you to be perfect. Can I just tell you, God knows already that we're not perfect. He's not waiting for us to reach a certain level of goodness before he says get out of the boat. Peter was far from perfect. Look how badly he messed it up that night. Jesus chastised him for, for not having enough faith. But I tell you what, at least Peter had enough to get out of the boat. How many other men got out of the boat that night? None. Peter, Peter didn't have enough faith. He lost focus. He was far from perfect. But at least he tried. None of the other disciples tried. None of the other disciples ever walked on water. You see how God can use imperfect people with just a little bit of faith? Yeah, he didn't have as much as he should have, and he lost focus. But that little bit of faith that Jesus talked about was enough for Peter to be used that night. Because the story ends, it says, when they got in the boat, the wind died down. And those other men in the boat worshipped Jesus. And they said, you truly are the Son of God. See that little bit of faith by Peter. Although far from perfect, God used it to teach all those other men a lesson. Peter gets all the bad press in this story. A lot of times all you hear the focus on is, is, that, is that Peter... Peter had, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? You know, and, and Peter started sinking and he cried out and Jesus had to rescue him. Yeah, all that happened. 
But at least Peter tried. And God used his imperfect faith to teach those other men a lesson. You know, and there's nothing in this story to indicate that all those other men could not have also have tried. None of them were told, stay in, you can't get out. They elected to remain in the comfort and familiarity of the boat. And as far as we know, none of them ever had another opportunity to walk on water. Now, there may be something that God is calling you to do, a boat he's calling you to get out of today. And I don't want to be negative, but this may be your last chance to do it. He may not give you that chance anymore. He may move on to somebody else who's more willing and who's, who's, who's willing to get out of the boat. Folks, God knows you're not perfect. In fact, I'll tell you, what God wants is people who know they're not perfect. God, God uses people who know they're messed up. God uses people who know they're broken, who know they're dirty, who know they're sinful, because those are the people who know they need him. Perfect people don't know they need him. Perfect people got it all together, at least they think. But the problem is there are a lot of people I deal with all the time. I promise you there are people in this room who your mindset is, well, you know, before I can do what God wants me to do, I've really got to make some improvements in my life, you know, and I've, I've got to get myself together. I've got to clean myself up a little bit. I, and, and what I'm telling you is that you can't do that to the point that you're good enough to, to get out of the boat on your own. There are people in this room right now saying, well, you know, I mean, I really can't trust Jesus just yet because, you know, I've got some things in my life I've got to change. You can't change them. Some people in this room right now saying, you know, I've you know, I got I to get to some things straight before I can volunteer and serve God. Well, you'll never get them straight enough. So what you're saying is I can't get out of that boat until I'm perfect or at least I'm a lot closer to perfect than I am now. And the truth is what God wants is he wants people who know they're not perfect, who will humble themselves before the Lord Jesus Christ and allow him to, to dress them in the righteous and perfection of Jesus. See, it's about getting out of the boat on faith, not because you're perfect, but because you know the one who is perfect is out there waiting for you. Yeah, we all need our lives cleaned up. I, I hate to tell you, but there's nobody in this room who's exactly who God wants them to be. There's dirt in all of our lives. There are things that God wants to clean up. But you know, the miraculous thing is, He will do that if you submit yourself to Him, dirt and all. He'll spend the rest of your life cleaning you up. And He'll clean you up outside the boat as He uses you. Outside the boat. You don't need to be perfect or even close to it to get out of whatever boat you're in right now. I'm going to conclude this. I'm going to show you a TV commercial. I see it a lot. And every time I see it, I, I, th I think of people and churches and sometimes myself who refuse to get out of the boat. We're just too afraid. See if it says that to you too. Why does consultant Jerry Howell stay at La Quinta? Can you come back tomorrow? Because only with La Quinta can Jerry instant hold the room tonight using just his phone number and then power down for tomorrow on his pillow top bed. And when Jerry's refreshed, you know what he does? We need ideas, people. Think, think. Synergistic integration. Genius. He thinks outside the box. I'm going for it. No. La Quinta Inns and Suites take care of you so you can take care of me. That's us. That's me sometimes. That's you. That's our church sometimes. That's churches all over the place. It reminds me of people who are willing to get out. I don't know what synergistic integration is. Sounds like a good out-of-the-box or out-of-the-boat idea. But it, but it reminds me of people who are willing to get out and those who won't. 
And it reminds me of another truth that is evident in the story of, of, that we just read. The vast majority of people never get out. I love the one guy who said, I'm going for it. In the story we read, only one out of 12 men got out of the boat. In that commercial, it illustrates the truth that if you decide to get out of a boat for the cause of Christ, don't expect everybody else to understand and join you. There may not be a crowd waiting to praise you outside the boat. But remember the truth. The one person you need outside the boat is waiting for you. So you've got all you need outside that boat. If we as a church continue to, to be an out-of-the-boat church, we can't do it based upon the praise and agreement of others because it won't always happen. We've got to be willing to be out there because we know that Jesus has called us and he's out there waiting for us. And that's all we need. I don't know what boat you're in today, but I ask you, are you in or out? What boat is God calling you out of today? And are you willing to get out of it for him today? What comfort zones are you stuck in? What traditions, what misguided beliefs, what, what fears are keeping you? from being and doing what God wants you to be. And my challenge is what I told you earlier. I'm not going to stop challenging people just because it scares you. If God is pricking your heart right now that you're stuck in a boat and you're willing to make a commitment to get out of it, come up here and get on your knees and tell him, God, that's me. I'm stuck and I want out.